It's like two seconds left. Thank you. Well, at least Taylor died today. Really? That's why she was all over. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You can figure out who dies by just figure out, you know, trending topic. Yeah, the Twitter trending topic. Oh, she must have died. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started here. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for joining us uh, remotely in the room, in our offices out there. I'm Mark Silva, I'm EVP Emerging Platforms here at Real Branding, the digital arm of Anthem Worldwide and, and a division of Shock. We have a core philosophy that applies uh, to all brand offline and, um, uh, offline and online of magnetism. It's of uh, creating the highest relevancy by creating brand connections that people are attracted to versus simply interrupting. And the three elements that we talk about a lot uh, around that is this idea of daring, endearing, and enduring. So you can imagine how excited we were uh, when we heard about Guy's latest mission of enchantment, which reflects how each of uh, these uh, work together. So um, I'd imagine you're attending in part, in a large part, due to Guy's very enchanting ways and uh, his amazing ability to put his beliefs into practice. So when Guy talks about enchantment, he's just not talking about it from an academic uh, distance. He lives it. We see it every day, uh, both online and for those of us who have the benefit of being in proximity. So we're looking forward to an enchanting hour. It's my great pleasure to introduce Guy Kawasaki. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, here I am. So uh, we're in a conference room in San Francisco, and uh, <laughs> I wish I could show the setup here. <laughs> it's on a U.S. postal uh, box, uh, priority mail, medium-sized box. Uh, anything that fits in here, you can ship for ten ninety-five. Just look. <laughs> is the U.S. Postal Service a client of yours? <laughs> They're going to be now. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you today about enchantment. Let, let me give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I worked for Apple from 1983 to 1987. I was Apple's software evangelist. So my job was to convince people to write Macintosh software. Uh, this man I worked for, Steve Jobs, which was a very interesting experience using the word interesting loosely. Uh, we, we were the largest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California in the Mac division. Uh, we held that record for a good 30 years. Uh, I think uh, Google probably broke it uh, recently. Uh, because we worked for Steve, we had very special rules, unlimited supplies of fresh orange juice. We had a travel policy that was to die for, which is any flight over two hours qualified for first class flight. And um, I lived about 45 minutes from the airport, so I defined two hours to begin from the moment you left your apartment. So I basically, I flew first class everywhere. Uh, I'd fly first class from you know San Francisco to Monterey. So uh, those were the days. Uh, back then, the company had two divisions, Apple II and Macintosh. The Apple II was making all the money. Macintosh was spending all the money. So if you looked at the P&L back then, the P was Apple II, the L was Macintosh. And uh, we were such bad people, we would not let Apple II division people into our building. Building. And if you think about it, that's the building they were paying for. So that pissed them off a little bit. And uh, they came up with this great joke, you know, how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. Uh, the Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. Uh, there's a Microsoft version of this joke, of course, because it's a Microsoft version of every joke. Uh, the Microsoft version is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer to that is none, because Steve Ballmer has declared darkness the new standard. Um, <laughs> I am going to talk to you today about enchantment, and before I do that, uh, I have noticed after 30 years of being in the tech business, I'm going to sneeze, uh, that the, there are two salient points about most tech speakers. Uh, first, they suck, and second, they go long. And that's a bad combination. You know, if you suck and you're short, it's okay. And if you're good and you go long, it's okay. But if you suck and you go long, it's like being stupid and arrogant. It's not a good combination. So what I've done is I've embraced the top 10 format for my speeches so that in case you think I suck, at least you know how much longer I'll suck by knowing that there's 10 points coming. 
So these are the 10 points. Uh, I, I have been in some way, manner, or form trying to enchant people since, oh, 1979 or so. I started in the jewelry business, believe it or not. And the jewelry business, uh, for all the glamour from the outside, it comes down to two commodities, gold and diamonds. And they may be expensive commodities, but they are commodities. And so a lot of the jewelry business when you're in the manufacturing end, as I was, is about enchanting your customers about the design of your jewelry. Uh, from then I went to the Mac division where I was enchanting people with a personal computer that had no install base, no tools, uh, no hard disk, no slots, no color. It was a piece of crap, but it was a you know revolutionary piece of crap. And I, I had to convince people to write software for this platform, which was a non-trivial task. So uh, th that's how I sort of cut my teeth on enchantment. Uh, lots of people have asked me, you know, how long did it take you to write this book? And in one sense, the answer is about a year, uh, but truly it took me about 30 years. So uh, this is everything I've learned about how to enchant people, how to change people's hearts and minds and actions. Um, I define enchantment as this process of building on a base of likability, trustworthiness, and a great product uh, or, or service to change the relationship you have with people. Uh, Tom Peters, I believe, set a new standard for business when he said, you know, we need to go from surviving to excellence. And I would like to set a new standard for personal relationships that goes from engagement to enchantment, where you actually delight people. And uh, let me start in the slides here. Uh, we think it's the right arrow. We're going to find out. It's not the right arrow. It's not the up arrow. Maybe it's a click of the mouse. No. <laughs> what did you click on? Oh, that little thing? Jeez. Yeah, I got a good aim here. Okay, so uh, step one in uh, enchantment is to achieve likability because if you think about it, uh, have you ever been enchanted by someone you didn't like? Probably not. And so this is kind of a basic. Uh, it is an important basic. It is somewhat of a duhism, as in duh. Of course, you have to be likable. But think of all the people that you know that are likable. Uh, so it's 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 a basic that needs to be told. There are uh, three starting points for likability. The first is a great smile. This is a picture of what's called a Pan Am smile. It is not a great smile. It is a smile that only uses the jaw, uh, and it's because you know truly what flight attendant is glad to see you uh, and probably very few uh, and vice versa other than Virgin America will come to Virgin America so uh, the key starting point is a great smile that's what enters the room first and you want a great smile to be a Duchenne smile a Duchenne smile uses two sets of muscles uh, both your jaw muscles and your eye muscles and uh, your eye muscles cause sort of a twinkling um, and this is what makes a true smile. And this is a picture of a woman named Marie Smith. She is a social media expert, uh, particularly Facebook. And so uh, she has a very good smile. Uh, she's a friend of mine, and I, I emailed her when I decided to use her picture in my presentation. And I said to her, you know, Marie, I have good news for you and bad news for you. The good news is you're going to be in all my presentations. The bad news is it's because you have really obvious crow's feet. So basically, I'm telling you that crow's feet is good. Um, forget the Botox, forget the, the, the lifts and the tucks and the plastic surgery. You actually want crow's feet for a great smile. The second thing is to dress for a tie, pun intended. There are three modes of dressing. One is you can underdress. So you go to a business format, a business session, and you know everybody will be in coats and ties, but you know because you have more power or you, know, you think you can get away with it, you underdress. You wear a t-shirt and jeans and sneakers. There's also the theory of overdressing. Overdressing means that you, you actually want to show people that you have better taste or more money. Um, and it also distances you from the audience. So what you really want to do is dress as peers. Uh, find out basically what the audience and the people you're meeting with, how they're dressing, and dress roughly equal to them. So that's the second step. The third step is very mathematical. This is the perfect handshake formula. Uh, it has to do with eye contact and the greeting length and the distance and the temperature of your hand, the smoothness of your hand, the vigor of your shake. Um, just memorize this formula and you'll have a much better handshake. 
Uh, for those of you who are in America, I just want you to know that none of your tax dollars are wasted uh, calculating this perfect handshake. Well, we like to waste our tax dollars bombing people instead. But um, this formula was done by the University of Manchester. So those of you in the UK, it is your tax dollars that <laughs> develop this perfect handshake formula for all of us to use in the world. So the starting point of likability is this perfect smile, you know, with two sets of muscles, uh, the perfect handshake, and dressing as tie as an equal or dressing for a tie. The second point is to achieve trustworthiness. You know, you can be likable, and you can be famous, and you can be popular, but that doesn't mean you're trustworthy. Uh, a good example of this is Charlie Sheen with his two million followers on uh, Twitter. Uh, you may like him, although even that's <laughs> debatable, but uh, certainly I don't think you would trust him for his advice. So let's go into trustworthiness. Uh, the starting per point of trustworthiness is that you have to trust others. That is, there's definitely a sweet a sequence. Um, many people may ask, well, do I trust people and then they trust me, or do I wait for them, you know, f do they trust me, do they trust me so then I trust them? Did I say that right? Uh, there, the point is, this is not a chicken or egg thing. There's a different sequence. You have to trust others if you want them to trust you. The onus is upon you. Amazon.com, for example, trusts you. They let you buy an e-book, a Kindle book, and you have up to five days to return it uh, for a full refund. That's trust. Zappos trust women to buy shoes, trust women to buy shoes so much that they can return the shoe and they will pay shipping both ways. Um, that's trustworthiness. And Nordstrom is a classic analog example of a brick and mortar organization that trusts people. So these are three examples of successful companies. And I think one of the big factors in their success is that they took the first step. They trusted others and now people trust them. The second thing about trustworthiness is that you need to bake, not eat. There are people who are eaters. They look at a pie and they say, ah, great pie. I want to get as big a piece of pie as possible. It's a zero-sum game. If I get more pie, you get less pie. If you get more pie, I get less pie. By contrast, there are bakers, and bakers see pies as an opportunity. They think, I can bake more pies, and I can bake bigger pies. Generally speaking, people who are trustworthy are bakers. They don't look at the world as a zero-sum game. The final quality of trustworthiness is that people who are trustworthy typically default to yes. That is, when you meet people, they're thinking, how can I help the other person, as opposed to how can that person help me? So they have a predisposition towards wanting to help people. They're always looking for ways to um, engage them and enchant them, as opposed to push them off or get something from them. So if you do these three things, you'll be much more trustworthy. The next step is to actually get ready to get your product, your service, or yourself ready to launch. Um, to do that, the first suggestion is you create something that's dicey. A dicey stands for deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant. Deep refers to the, the quantity of functionality and features of a product. Great products are deep. They have lots of function. They are also intelligent. It means that when you look at this product or this service, it's easy to conclude that the company that created it or the person that created it really understood your problem. Um, I'll give you a very good example. I have two teenage sons and uh, one is getting a permit and one has a license and I want to buy a Ford Mustang in the worst way. Uh, in particular, a GT500 Shelby Ford Mustang. This is a Mustang that goes 0 to 60 in 4.1 seconds, uh, 550 horsepower. It is you know, just this total badass Mustang. Uh, one of the problems with me buying this Mustang is inevitably my two kids will be driving it and it's like socially irresponsible to hand them a car with that much power. So I found out that Ford makes something which I consider a very intelligent product. It's called MyKey. And what MyKey enables you to do is program the top speed of a car into the key. So I could give my kids the key to the car programmed to 55 miles per hour maximum speed. Um, it doesn't control how fast you get to 55 miles an hour, but it controls the top speed of 55 miles an hour. I think that's a very intelligent product. The next aspect of a great product or service is completeness. That great software is not just the digital download. It's the software, it's the documentation, it's the online support, it's the string of enhancements, it's the webinar, it's the conference, it's the app developers, it's the plug-in architecture. It's all that stuff that makes great software. 
what makes a great car is not just the physical representation of the car, the glass, the steel, and the rubber. It's also the after-service support. That's what makes Lexus a complete car. The first thing stands for empowering. Great things are empowering. They make you feel more creative, more productive. Um, Apple is very good at this. And Apple is also very good at elegance. They care about the user interface. So one way to prepare um, is to create something dicey, deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant. Um, you know, there's a theory called Guy's Golden Touch. And Guy's Golden Touch is not whatever I touch turns to gold. I wish that were true. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold Guy touches. And this is a, a way for me to tell you that um, it is much easier to be enchanting with something great than to be enchanting with a piece of crap. So create something dicey. Second way to prepare is to uh, yeah. categorize and position right. and brand and, pos and you know just discuss right. your product, your service in short, sweet and swallowable ways. That is, without using industry acronyms, without trying to say this is the fifth paradigm of personal computing that we're ushering in today, uh, without using gigabytes and terabytes and you know all the other stuff that nerds love to talk about. This is an example of an ad that was created after 9-11 to raise awareness for people who you know, might be leaving bombs in mass transit. And it's simply, if you see something, say something. Um, try to use that kind of phrase. You know, try to use a two or three word mantra that explains why your product or service exists, as opposed to the typical 50 or 60 word mission statement um, that seeks to be good for the employees, the customers, the shareholders, and if you're from California, you have to encompass the dolphins and the whales, and you end up with just basically a less than memorable piece of crap. Uh, short, sweet, and swallowable. And the third thing is to conduct a pre-mortem. A pre-mortem is an exercise you conduct before you ship something. Uh, a post-mortem is obviously you conduct after the thing dies. So the way pre-mortem works is you assemble the group and you say, all right, so time out. Let's suppose that our product dies. Let's suppose that we fail. What were the major causes of this failure? Software was too buggy, software was slow, uh, Salesforce was unsophisticated, lack of distribution, Microsoft uh, entered the market with a free product, uh, we had lousy support. Uh, whatever it is, come up with all those reasons and let's go down through that list and see if we can eliminate as many reasons as possible in advance. We'll do a pre-mortem instead of a post-mortem. Very useful exercise to prevent failure. The next step is to actually launch your product or service. Uh, first thing I recommend is you need to tell a story. Uh, typically this is not a story about how you um, have all these gigabytes and terabytes and megahertzes and all this kind of stuff in it. Tell a story about why two people in a garage created a company that would bring personal computing to people instead of having to work for a large government organization or a bank or working for a university. You wanted to bring personal computers to people. Tell a story about how your, your girlfriend wanted to sell her Pez collection online so you created eBay, even though that story is fiction. But it is a great story. Um, great stories are the key to a launch, not technical explanation. The second way to launch is to plant many seeds. Um, I think there are two prevailing marketing theories. Uh, marketing 1.0 was that you had an identifiable minority of people who were A-listers, journalists and analysts. They worked for the New York Times, they worked for Wall Street Journal, they were famous, they were powerful. You sucked up to them. You sucked up to them because you prayed that they would love your product and they would tell the great unwashed masses and the hoi polloi that we approve of this product. Now all of you go use one, two, three. You know we have decreed that one, two, three is the way to go. Um, so you, you spend much of your life uh, identifying these famous, powerful people and then sucking up to them. If you didn't have time to suck up to them, then you hired a PR firm to do the sucking up for you. Then the PR firm would charge you $15,000 a month and they would assign an Oriental Art History from Wellesley who doesn't even use a computer to suck up for you. And uh, basically, it was top-down marketing. I have a different theory. Uh, marketing 2.0 means that you plant many seeds because you really don't know who are the people who are going to make your product successful. 
Uh, it could be Lonely Boy 15 instead of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. And it could be Tiffany 65 who does it. It's Tiffany and her 50 friends and Lonely Boy 15 with her with his 75 friends that tip your product. Uh, this is a very different marketing theory. And, and I, I cite as one example Twitter. Um, I'd like for someone to show me that on the day that Twitter came out or the day that they start, started showing it to the to the oracles and the A-listers, show me one reporter that said, I've seen the future of communications. It's called Twitter. It enables you to send out 140 character text messages. People will be using it to tell other people around the world that their cat rolled over or the line at Starbucks is long and someday it's going to bring down you know, totalitarian regimes around the world. I've seen the future of Twitter, the future of communications. That article never happened. Twitter became successful because the great unwashed masses who were at South by Southwest one year just fell in love with it and more and more people used it. Finally, the people who were the A-listers and the, the famous journalists had to write about Twitter because it was so popular. Uh, if they did not write about Twitter, they would look like they're clueless. And so, you know, now the tail is wagging the dog. Uh, but if you believe this theory, then you'll plant many seeds because you don't know who's going to make you tip. I'm not saying you should ignore the A-listers, but I am saying you should not focus on the A-listers solely because um, you want a bottoms-up approach to marketing. The last point about uh, launching is to use salient points. Uh, on the left side, you see the points that are used by the industry. On the right side, you see what people really care about. Is it miles per gallon as the automobile industry likes to communicate things or the yearly cost of running the car? Is it the degrees on your thermostat or the heating costs for your year? Is it gigabytes or is it the number of songs? Do people wake up in the morning saying, if only I had a 64 gigabyte iPod, I would be happy? Or do they wake up in the morning saying, you know, I need something that can contain thousands of songs and lots of movies and lots of pictures? You salient points. The next step, step five, is to overcome resistance. I wish I could tell you that if you had a great product or service, that the world would be the path to your door. Um, frankly, it may be quite the contrary, that the more innovative your product or service, the more resistance you'll encounter because you threaten the status quo. This is a picture of a robot that came with a family computer system by Nintendo. Believe it or not, in the late 70s, the game business, the electronic gaming business, was a very unpopular business. In fact, retailers were tired uh, stocking electronic games and resisted it. So Nintendo realized it had a problem. You know, how do we get retailers to carry our new computer? Or, excuse me, our new electronic game. And so what they did is they didn't call it a game anymore. They added a robot to this to this thing, and they called it a toy because retailers were not resistant to stocking toys for Christmas. And the further refinement on the position was people called it an electronic uh, toy, an educational toy, not simply a toy. So now kids could ask their parents for an educational toy for Christmas, and it overcame resistance to the game. Um, step one in in you know. Breaking down resistance is to provide social proof. So uh, who among us, when the iPod first came out, didn't start noticing that lots of people used white earbuds? And what does white earbud mean? It means iPod. And so you started noticing people using more and more of these white earbuds. And you said, you know, this must mean that iPod is getting more successful. It must mean that iPod is good. It must mean that I should buy an iPod. So when you succumb to that enchantment, you bought a white iPod, or you bought an iPod with a white earbud. And so now there were more white earbuds in the world, so more people saw social proof, so more iPods sold, so more earbuds were around. And I don't know if Apple planned this purposely, I doubt it, but I certainly think that the mere white earbud contributed to the success of iPod. The social proof can also work the opposite way. Um, Robert Cialdini, who is a peer of mine, a uh, professor in social psychology, his student conducted a study in Arizona at the uh, Petrified Wood uh, Park, and they had a problem with tourists stealing petrified wood, so they created a sample area, they controlled the amount of samples of petrified wood in an area, and they tried three different signs, or three different conditions. One condition was no sign. Another condition was a sign showing one person stealing petrified wood, but telling you not to. 
And the third condition was a sign showing many people stealing petrified wood saying not to. So in order of effectiveness, the most effective sign for preventing stealing of petrified wood was one person stealing wood telling you not to steal the wood. The second most effective method was no sign at all. The third most effective, least effective sign was showing many people stealing wood but telling you not to steal the wood. And the thinking is that even though you're telling people not to do something, they saw a sign with many people stealing things, so they thought, oh, it must be okay to steal it even though the sign says not to steal it because many people are on the sign stealing it. That's an example of how social proof can work against you. The next thing you could do to overcome resistance is to find some bright spot in what you're doing. That when you introduce something, um, you, you're going to overcome, you're going to encounter a lot of resistance. But you know, they're, they're always, what kind of sign are you guys passing around? Here? What does that sign say? <laughs> like people are disturbing me. How can you give a good webinar and like people are holding signs around here? Jeez. We turn off. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the key here is that when you introduce something. Find that one bright spot. I'll give you a, first a technology example. When Macintosh came out in the early or mid 80s, um, you know, we did well for the first 180, 100 days, no problem. But after that, it became a real battle. And we thought we had a word processing spreadsheet and database machine. And if you're a Macintosh user from back then, you'd realize we were zero for three there. So the one bright spot in the Macintosh community was desktop publishing. It was created by Aldous PageMaker. Aldous PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple Computer. It saved Apple. If it wasn't for Aldous PageMaker, there would be no Apple. And then we would all have phones with battery that lasted all day. We'd have phones with real keyboards. We'd have phones that didn't depend on AT&T, sucky data network. It would be a different world. So anyway, Aldous PageMaker was a gift from God. And by the way, I believe in God. And one of the main reasons I believe in God is having worked at Apple, I can see no other explanation for the continued survival of Apple than the existence of a benevolent God. Anyway, so the one bright spot was desktop publishing, and we yeah. ran with that bright spot, and it saved Apple. This is a picture of Vietnam. It depicts a scenario where people were going to Vietnam to try to help fight malnutrition. And one person who went there noticed that in every village there were a few families that had much healthier children. And he couldn't understand this because they were in the same village, roughly the same income. You know, what made them healthy compared to the other kids? And he found out that these families were putting shrimps and crabs from the rice patties into the food of the kids. So they were getting much more protein. And the other families were not doing that. So that simple bright spot is how he fought malnutrition, by making that different, that slight change to people's diets, training other mothers to add shrimps and crabs from the rice patties into the diet of their kids. Find a bright spot. And the last thing is to enchant all the influencers. That when you, you know, approach a company or a family to make a decision, you shouldn't assume that it's a, you know, a single decision point or in most cases you think when you're approaching a family, it's the father that's making the decision. Uh, let me tell you something, you're probably very wrong. It's probably the mother. It may be the sister-in-law. In an Asian family in particular, because we believe in filial piety, it could be the grandfather. Uh, I'll tell you personally, in my family, it is the daughter. Basically, I will do anything to make my daughter happy. So uh, if you want to get to me, you have to get to my daughter. Um, and I'll tell you, that, you know, the mark of a good webinar speaker is you never get irrelevant. Uh, I'm going to show you that the mark of a great webinar speaker, however, is that you can get irrelevant and come back. I'm going to show you that right now. So. Speaking of my daughter, um, this is an appeal that you may not believe. Um, if, if any of you are on Twitter right now, I predict that you're now going to tweet something to this effect. Uh, I recommend that all of you who are interested in marketing go see the Justin Bieber movie, Never Say Never. Now, you may be astounded that I said that, but I'll tell you something. I took my daughter to that movie. And uh, there are many, many marketing lessons in that movie. Highly recommended. For one thing, you see how hard Justin Bieber works. It's amazing. He's, he's on this 86 city tour. So all of us in technology, you know, we go to South by Southwest and over three days we have to make two speeches and we're just like, oh, woe is me. I am so exhausted. I had to make two one hour speeches and, you know, be on one panel and make a speech. And oh my God, don't you feel sorry for me? Justin Bieber's making 86 stops traveling on a bus. That's how hard that kid works. 
Secondly, watch the interaction between Beaver and his vocal coach. It's the most fascinating mentoring um, relationship I've seen. Third thing is he has his people go out in the parking lots of the concerts and before the concert and he finds these girls who don't have tickets and they hand them free tickets. It's the most enchanting little video vignettes of you know his people just making these girls so happy. So the bottom line is, you know, who among us would not like to control a market niche the way Justin Bieber controls his market niche? You should see that movie. Just try. If, if you go to that movie and you don't like it and you don't learn something, I'll give you your ticket back. I'll pay for your ticket. Um, the sixth thing is to endure. So we're going to make this amazing transition from Justin Bieber to the Grateful Dead. Uh, one of the groups that has truly endured in music is the Grateful Dead for decades. You know, third, fourth generation Grateful Dead fans. One of the ways that the Grateful Dead endures is because they have a area at every an area at every uh, concert for what they call tapers. Although people don't use tape anymore, so what they do is they enable people to record the concert and then spread the music. Uh, think about that. How many how many groups do you know of encourage the piracy of their music at concerts. Not very many. But by doing this, the Grateful Dead has more people, Grateful Dead evangelists, you know, sharing the music, spreading the music. That's one of the factors that makes the Grateful Dead endure. So, step number one, or advice number one is, if you want to make your enchantment endure, don't rely on money. Um, money is usually the enemy of enchantment. At a very tactical level, if you're paying people to sell your product, evangelize your product, enchant people with your product, um, already the motive is suspect. Those people will be wondering, am I doing this because of the, the compensation of the affiliate fee or am I doing it because I truly believe this is the best product or service? The people on the recipient side of the enchantment and the sales and the evangelism, they'll be thinking, is this person telling me to use this computer or use this iPod, iPhone, iPad, or use this service, use this website? Is this person telling me to do this because this person believes it's the best thing for me or because the person is an affiliate and is on commission? Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't pay people, but if, if the crux and the basis and foundation of your enchanting relationship with people is money, uh, you will fail. Second thing is you need to invoke the power of reciprocation. Uh, reciprocation is an extremely powerful force in our society. Indeed, it holds our society together. If we did not have this deep-rooted sense of obligation and reciprocation, the world would fall apart. Uh, this is a carpet that depicts a battle between the Italians and the Ethiopians because Italy invaded Ethiopia in the 1930s. Uh, to support the Ethiopians, the people of Mexico donated money and sent money to Ethiopia. About 85 years later, there was a big earthquake in Mexico. Lots of people died, lots of suffering. And the people of Ethiopia, even though they were in the middle of a famine and arguably had less money than people of Mexico, the Ethiopians collected money and sent it to the people of Mexico to reciprocate for the time that Mexico helped Ethiopia. Uh, another example of this occurred in after 9-11. Um, right after the Civil War, the people of New York, the Northerners, bought the people of Charleston, South Carolina, a fire truck because they heard that the people of South Carolina were using a bucket brigade to fight fires. Uh, 150 or 60 years later after 9-11, the people of Charleston bought the people of New York a fire truck because they had vowed earlier that if New York ever needed the help of Charleston, that Charleston would reciprocate. So I'm going to give you two power tips about reciprocation um, from Robert Cialdini. First, when you do something for somebody and they thank you, instead of merely saying you're welcome when they, when they thank you, the optimal response is to say, I know you would do the same for me. The reason why you say this is twofold. One is you are telling the person you are an honorable person. I know you would do the same for me. You're an honorable person. You believe in reciprocation. The second reason why you do this is you're telling the person, I know you would do the same for me. You owe me. And so uh, this is the optimal welcome response. Second tip about reciprocation is this, that when people owe you, you may be tempted to let them off the hook, to never expect repayment, which is actually good to not expect repayment. but. You know, you may think, uh, you know, 
don't worry about it, don't sweat it, you don't really owe me anything. And that is actually a disservice to both of you. When people owe you a favor, you should find ways for them to pay you back. Because by enabling to, to pay you back, you actually relieve the pressure on them, that they don't carry around this burden of, oh, God, I owe, I owe Mark something, you know, I wish I could pay him back, so I, every time I see him, I don't feel embarrassed, because I don't know, maybe he's thinking that I owe him something. Um, you should enable people to pay you back. That way, you clear the decks. You, you know, you put the, the accounts back in order, and then that person can ask you to do more things, or you could ask that person to do more things. Um, it's always very good to enable people to pay you back. Uh, don't, don't uh, hesitate to enable people to pay you back. The third thing to make your uh, enchantment endure is to build an ecosystem. That is the totality of what surrounds your product, your service, that you want resellers and VARs and retailers, you want user groups, you know, Harley Davidson user group, the Apple Macintosh user groups, um, you want websites that talk about your product or service, you want blogs, you want online seminars and conferences, uh, you want all these kinds of things, you want all these people tied to you, they make your product better by supplementing what you offer and they are tied to you so that they want you to be successful because they will be successful if you're successful. Build an ecosystem. The seventh thing is that great enchanters are able to present. They are able to pitch and to speak. Let me explain how to do this. First of all, customize the introduction. When you start a speech, customize the introduction. It was difficult for me to do this today because people are all over the world. Uh, so I, I went with the generic start, but this is how you should do it, not as I did it today. Uh, this is a picture of an LG washer and dryer. Uh, the circumstance here is that I was in Brazil to speak to the management of the LG Latin America team. And after I got to Brazil, I figured out that I'm an LG customer. I have an LG washer and dryer. I bought the LG washer because it has a steam cycle. I've never used that steam cycle, but when I read about it, I thought, that's such a cool thing. I could just steam my clothes. And so, uh, but I was already in Brazil. It was too late. So I sent a text message to my two older boys, you know, the same boys that I don't want them driving the Mustang. So I sent a text message to them, and I told them, go downstairs, take a picture of the washer and dryer. You know, use your iPhone 4s, the iPhone 4s that your dad bought you. Go use the iPhone 4s, take a picture, send it to me. And I sent this text message to both of them because I needed a backup plan. You know, because just sending it to one, the odds of one of them doing it is zero. The odds of two of them doing it is, well, <laughs> you'll see. So anyway, so I sent the text message uh, and I wait a few hours, nothing happens. So then I figure I should send another text message just to subtly remind them. And I chose to send the text message to my older son, Nick. So I sent the text message to Nick Kawasaki saying, did you get my text messages? Because I'm not getting the photos over here in Brazil. He sends me back a message that says, Noah, his younger brother, said that he took the pictures. And by the way, since you're speaking to LG, do you think you could get us some TVs? <laughs> because... You know, we're playing Halo and Call of Duty on these small TVs that are not high definition and truly to, you know, get the total effect of Halo and COD, uh, you need high definition LG flat panel, LCD, you know, half inch thick TVs. And as you can see, my response uh, in the spirit of non-reciprocation was, I doubt it since you didn't send me the picture. Uh, the point here is, customize the introduction. It, it, it definitely created a much better sort of vibe in the audience when you can, when I stood up and I said, listen, I'm speaking to you, LG. I want you to know I'm an LG customer. This is actual pictures of my washer and dryer from my house. The second thing is, when you make a presentation, when you make a speech, sell your dream. I talked earlier about telling a story. So tell a story, how you came to invent this product or service. But then when you're actually talking about the product or service, Sell your dream. What does it mean? It means coolness. It means creativity, productivity, romance, peace of mind, whatever it means. You know, when Steve Jobs sells an iPhone, he doesn't stand up and he says, let me get my iPhone here. He doesn't stand up and he says, you know, this is two pieces of stuff. 
it is $188 of parts. It's manufactured in China. And we stick you with a, a two-year contract with AT&T. Uh, that's not how he positions an iPhone. He positions an iPhone as this dream of creativity and productivity and hundreds of thousands of, you know, there's an app for that. Sell your dream. The, the last part about presentations is to use what I call the 10, 20, 30 rule of presentations. The optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10, 10. You'd be lucky to get 10 ideas across. Now some of you who have been keeping track may wonder, you know, guy, you've had way more than 10 slides. And the answer to that is twofold. First of all, you're not me. <laughs> secondly, secondly um, a lot of, I have a lot of slides because I like to use bullet points. And I like to use bullet points that are individually illustrated with pictures. And so one slide that could be click, 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 three bullet points, really becomes three slides for me. The second point is to be able to give these 10 slides in 20 minutes. You may have a one-hour meeting, but many of you use uh, Windows laptops, and it's going to take you 40 minutes to make it work with the projector, so you should plan on doing it in 20 minutes. And the final step is that you should use the 30-point font. Um, a rule of thumb is find out who the oldest person is in the audience, divide his or her age by two. So if you're pitching to 55, 60 year old people, 27 and a half point font or 30 point font. Now, you know, VCs are getting younger, managers are getting younger, boards of directors are getting younger. Someday you may be pitching to a 16 year old. God bless you. At that time, use an eight point font. But until that day, until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. The next thing to do is use technology to engage uh, and enchant. It, it is a great time to be a marketing person, let's face it. So first of all, you need to remove the speed bumps from your technology, from your websites. This is an example of CAPTCHA. So the first word is clearly HOLBER, H-O-L-B-E-R. What is the second word? Is it Farsi? Is it Hiragana, Katakana? It's actually Hebrew. And I've, I've been told that that's the Hebrew word for trouble or flaws or something like that. So it's a perfectly appropriate word. But you know, imagine that you're, you know, you're Joe Blow or you're Trixie or you're Tiffany and you, you want to join this site and you encounter this thing where you're creating a, uh, an account and for you to prove that you're not a robot, you have to type in these two words, Hober and whatever that word is in Hebrew. Uh, if, even if you knew what that word was in Hebrew, do you have a Hebrew keyboard? I mean, you know, think of the speed bumps that you put in front of people. Second, at the end of the day, if you want to be successful on social media, most of your tweets and your updates have to be about these three things. It's either information, what just happened, insights, what does this happening mean, or assistance, how do you get to happen for you, you know, how do you prevent this bad thing from happening. Um, if, if you generally think of your Facebook updates and your tweets as providing one of these three things, uh, I think you'd be much more successful in social media. And the last thing is some guidelines for engagement. First of all, the optimal time to answer email is within 48 hours. Uh, listen, I, I don't, I, I'm not able to achieve this also, but this is the goal. Uh, you should be engaging with many people, not just the A-listers, not just the rich, famous, powerful people, but anybody. Lonely Boy 15, who's going to make your product tip. You don't even know who he is. Lonely Boy 15 asks you a question, sends you a direct message, sends you an at, sends you an email, answer. And the last thing is, you need to use social media often. It's not something that you use when everything else is done. Social media should be core to your existence, not context. Two more points. First, you want to enchant your boss, let me explain how. Step one in enchanting your boss. When your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. You might not like it. You might not find this tasteful. Tough. Basically, I'm telling you, if you want to enchant your boss, when your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. As a sidelight, a corollary, if you want to enchant your wife, when your wife asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. You'll be much happily married. <laughs> so. The point here is that you really don't know what's going on in your wife's life or your boss's life. If they tell you to do something, do it. Second thing is, prototype fast. If, if your boss asks you to build a PowerPoint presentation that you, she needs in a week, the next day, come in with a, a text outline. This is the outline that became this presentation. Um, in this case, I was working with an outside designer, but I sent her this way in advance of the deadline, I said, okay, this is the text, now you make it beautiful. Prototype fast. It means that you'll be 
you'll be impressing your boss because your boss will see, wow, you know, I just asked him to do this yesterday and he already he's got the draft for me. The second thing is it increases the probability that you will actually do the right thing uh, by having a prototype in advance. Third thing is always deliver bad news early. You never want bad news to be a surprise. In fact, you should deliver bad news early and with the solution. That's even better. Deliver bad news early. Next, next point is how do you enchant down? How do you enchant the people who work for you? First thing is provide a map. MAP stands for mastery. You want to tell your employees, if you come work for us, come work for me, you'll master new skills. You'll learn how to use social media. You'll learn how to shoot video. You'll learn how to uh, debug programs. You'll learn how to create press releases. Whatever it is, um, you'll master new skills. You will master new skills while working autonomously. We're not going to micromanage you, breathe down your neck, and check on you every five minutes. You'll be working autonomously. And you'll be working on a higher purpose, not simply to make a buck. We don't just make widgets here with $188 of parts manufactured in China. We are trying to change the world, making the world more creative, more productive, giving people peace of mind, whatever it is. This is enchanting to tell an employee you, you'll be a better person, more skills, you'll be working independently, and you'll be working on a high purpose. Notice that I did not mention money. Um, money, you should... You should pay people reasonably, but but if people work for you solely because of money, uh, I doubt that you'll enchant them. Then they're only as good as the last paycheck. Next thing is empower action. Basically, you're saying to people, I think you're smart, and because I think you're smart, I'm going to enable you to make a decision independently, to do what's right for the customer. And the final way to enchant an employee is to be like micro in dirty jobs. You need to suck it up which means that you are willing to do anything to make this company successful. That it's not above you to mix paint. That you know, if you watch Dirty Job, Mike Rowe mix paints. He cleans out drains, he cleans out sewers, he gets underneath the house and removes dead rats. He changes power lines at the top of these towers in Colorado. Uh, he makes poi in Hawaii. He cleans the outside of uh, high rises in Hawaii. He shows what it takes to be a window washer. He sucks it up. So as a, a great boss, you should think, you know, am I micro? Am I sucking it up? Am I doing things that I would ask my employees to do? Uh, great bosses also suck it up. And then the last thing, I have a little story for you. Um, I crowdsourced the cover of Enchantment. And uh, this was the winning entry. I love this design. But I showed it to my publisher. And my publisher said, you know, this is... This is too artsy-fartsy, this is too self-help, this is too Boulder, Colorado, Shirley MacLaine sitting under crystals, feminine cover, no real man will buy this book if you have this blue butterfly. Can you imagine getting on an airplane and seeing a real man, you know, reading this book? And they said, I don't think so. So then I went back to the drawing board and I said, you know, I'm Japanese, so hell, there's origami. Not that I knew anything about origami at that moment. So like anybody else, I type in origami butterfly. And long story made short, I come across a guy named Michael LaFosse. And Michael LaFosse is the Wayne Gretzky of origami. So he's this origami master. I get in touch with him and I say, you know what, I, I need a butterfly. I love your existing designs. But I want to be able to say that in a, I, I have a truly custom made butterfly. I want a Kawasaki butterfly. So he created this. This is the Kawasaki swallowtail. Uh, have you ever heard of a Zuckerberg swallowtail or a Job swallowtail, Ellison swallowtail? Uh, who else? Uh, who else is famous? Yeah, yeah well, the Mark Silver swallowtail. No, I don't think so. Uh, so this is the Kawasaki swallowtail. One and only Kawasaki swallowtail. So this butterfly, which I consider, if you thought of a butterfly having mated with a stealth B-1 bomber, this is the butterfly you would guess. This is a badass butterfly. This is one piece of paper until it became the iconic symbol for uh, enchantment. And uh, I forgot here. Let me get this bag here. Let me get something out of this bag. I actually have the butterfly with me. So uh, this is the V butterfly here. And um, uh, it was a very fun story. So this is the story of how this cover had this butterfly. And that, in 50 minutes, 
is uh, the art of enchantment, how to be an enchanting person, how to change people's hearts, minds, and actions. Uh, thank you very much. All right. I think we've got some questions. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Applause by by text. Thank you. Um, any um, any questions over the uh, transom there? Will we just read the question? Yeah, we'll read we'll read the uh, questions in. I've got one for you while we're okay. waiting. Um, what was the most enchanting moment with Steve Jobs you had? Oh. <laughs> uh, by far, I think the most enchanting moment I had with Steve Jobs it was you know, kind of a gang bang. It was exactly one on one. Was when he introduced Macintosh. Uh, the introduction of Macintosh on January 24th, or actually it was the weekend, the Friday before, uh, when he introduced Macintosh, and the way they did it was at the stage, at a stage at De Anza College, and uh, he. He pulled Macintosh out of the Macintosh bag, and the Macintosh had speech synthesis. And he said, some, "The Macintosh says something like, uh, it's really good to get out of that bag.'" And it was, it was like just brought tears to my eyes. The first time I saw Macintosh, it was a religious experience. It was, you know, if you were in the Apple II world or the IBM PC world, you thought in terms of 24 by 80. If you were lucky, you had upper and lower case. Uh, you moved the cursor around using cursor keys. There was no mouse, no trash can, no Mac Paint, no Mac Write, um, no fonts integrated with with graphics. Uh, it was just basically one big dumb terminal. And when you saw Macintosh for the first time, it was a religious experience. Uh, what are the most enchanting channels in social media that you use? Uh, the most enchanting channel that I use in social media is, is probably Twitter. Uh, because I pound on Twitter. Uh, I use Twitter as a marketing platform. For me, it's not about um, you know engaging with a few of my kumbaya close friends. Uh, Twitter for me is a weapon, and I have about between the two accounts that I focus on, I have about three hundred and sixty or seventy thousand followers, and these are all followers that signed up voluntarily. I was never on the uh, Twitter suggested user list, so um, these are people who, you know, knowingly selected to follow me. Uh, so I use Twitter that way. I also use Facebook, and I, I've noticed a very big difference on Twitter. My primary purpose is to tweet out interesting links. So in, in, you know, in the presentation I showed where was um, yeah, but uh, information like, or assistance or analysis. <laughs> uh, I provide primarily information. I, I have, super early. believe it or not, I have you about know, 21 contributors to App Guy Kawasaki like who can tweet as me. So App Guy Kawasaki is pushing links constantly. Now, just FYI, because you know, lots of Twitter fascists they just go crazy when they find out that I have 21 people contributing as me. Um, if you send me an app message or a direct message or you mention me, if there's a response, it is only me. The contributors only push out. So, you know, think of Mashable, at Mashable or at the New York Times. There's somebody there and they just push out stuff. If you sent an app message to New York Times or at Mashable, highly unlikely you'll get a response. Um, if you did that for me, highly likely you will get a response and it will only be me. So I've noticed that on, on Twitter, I use primarily links. On Facebook, I use primarily pictures. I have right. tweeted or I've, I've right. updated Facebook with the same links that I use on Twitter, and there's not nearly as many likes or comments or interactions. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes but if I put up a picture, like, really like before I started this presentation, really um, like I went into the, the Anthem kitchen Some and just, just trying to find a soda, writing. which was you know not fruitful know. because all I could I find out was you know yeah, honest tea. Who the hell drinks honest tea? So anyway, is this is this your client? We drink Lipton tea. You drink Lipton tea because that's your client. Yeah. Okay. So Lipton tea. Did I just blow it for you? <laughs> well, you know, you should. Well, what can I say? Yeah, you just dig right. deeper, yeah. So anyway, so um, so I went into the refrigerator. I opened the freezer, and there's like 
ahead. Like, of there must be 60 cases of you know, gallons or half gallons of ice cream. I, I've never seen so much ice cream. And, and, you know, definitely you're contributing to the, the lack of health of your employees. But anyway, so I took a picture of that refrigerator and I posted the, the freezer with all this ice cream and I posted it on Facebook. And if you go to Facebook slash Enchantment, you'll see that many people have commented on that picture. So uh, some, something very well, interesting about Facebook is a funny picture on Facebook but then it is much more powerful than I mean, a good link. Like, yeah, and then um, the I'm going to post a picture of this particular setup we have here with this high-tech, you know, USPS priority mail podium here. Podium, and I'm going to tweet that and people are going to, like, you know, send a lot of comments about that too. So... Uh, yeah, let's hang out there. Yes. Hey, well, now all these questions have been scrolling by. You know what? We, 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 we've got time for one more question, of course, because we're already out of time. But the, the most obvious question is when does this come out? Uh, this book has been out since March 8th, and uh, believe it or not, uh, without cheating, it's now on the New York Times bestseller list uh, because there are ways to cheat and get it on there. But I did not cheat, and so it's been very gratifying. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a one more story. What, why is there a time limit? I, mean, well, I think we're going to start losing people from, from the Grand Square side. So. I don't know. We're still at 143. Um, so, okay, we'll, we'll keep going. Okay, so I'll tell you one last story. So, you know, I said something about plant many seeds. So when you typically uh, release a business book, you send out about 200 galleys uh, to the usual suspect, New York Times, Washington Post. You know, through the big business bloggers, CNN, Wired, and all that. Um, in my case, eating my own dog food, or at least you know, listening to my own bullshit talking, uh, we sent out 1,600 copies of this book. And so today, there are roughly 300 reviews of this book already on the internet. And that is roughly 280 more than you would expect at this point. And it's because... Um, like we sent it to any blogger who asked. Uh, I have this property called Alltop where we aggregate news by topics and there are 20,000 bloggers on Alltop. So we sent an email to 20,000 people saying, I'm coming out with this That's book, like, would you like a, a copy to review? And about 1,100 said yes, so 5% said yes. And, uh, and these were not just business not bloggers just and social media bloggers and tasks, marketing bloggers. These were bloggers like, that were oh my God, you know, my vegetarian blogs so and so there's an esthetician blogger and so this book is being reviewed on beauty blogs you know so they usually talk about mascara and foundation and now they're talking about enchantment oh, yeah. and so I'm trying to plant many seeds because uh, if a beauty blogger says well I usually talk about mascara but I found this really beautiful book that will help you become even more beautiful inner beauty it's enchantment and you ought to read it I mean hallelujah yeah. I declare victory mm -hmm. right? you know uh, you know, if Kim the beauty blogger makes me tip, you know, praise God. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, uh, I'll take it. So, uh, you know, that that is another great story. I don't think anybody in the history of business books has seeded 1,600 copies. Uh, uh, and another story to this story is that uh, when I was doing the intro planning with the publisher, they said we ought to do a video. Uh, we'll, we'll do a viral video, which is already, you know, stop because nobody purposely does a viral video, right? Everybody says, yeah, let's do a viral video. And then, and so like tens of thousands of people try to do a viral video and like two of them go viral. And so whatever happened to the other tens of thousands. So all these people, these, the publisher said, why, why don't we do a viral video that'll cost 15 or 20 grand? I said, you're crazy. I mean, the probability of a viral a video going viral is zero. And even if it went viral, it doesn't mean that just because lots of people watched, you know, Evian Babies Dancing, it doesn't mean they bought Evian. And just because, you know, have you started using Old Spice? I mean, I haven't. So, so the fact that a video goes viral yeah. doesn't mean anything. So, you know, instead of spending 20 grand that way, just give me the 20 grand and we'll send out 1,800 copies of the book. And you know, arguably, it was much better money spent. So, Plenty anyway, last seeds. story. Yeah, no, it's planting many seeds. I, so, another question, if we are going to go longer, is... Um, about uh, enchanting internal co-workers and other people that mm -hmm. you work with. Yeah, as that. peers, not up or down. Yeah. Uh, I would make the case that if you want to enchant your peers, and I talked about enchanting up where you drop everything and down where you provide a map, uh, enchanting your equals, I really have to do both. Uh, if an equal asks you to... <laughs> Did we just die? No, we're good. 
Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they stop seeing it, right? right. So yeah. No, no, no. Okay. So yeah, let's see it. So, uh, so if you want to enchant your peers, if if they ask you to do something and you dropped everything and did it, wow, you know, that's very enchanting. Um, and if you also provide them with, you know, the ability to gain mastery by working with you, uh, and that you know you're working as peers, you're not micromanaging them, you're not hounding them for results all the time. And finally, that you share this purpose, that it is not about individual fiefdom, but it is about the greater good of the company, that the company is making people more creative, more productive, empowering them. Uh, I think that would definitely enchant one's peers. Okay? Great. Thanks a lot, Guy. I really appreciate Thank you. having you here. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to pause for a couple seconds. Thanks for everybody who attended. We'll, uh, <coughs> we'll uh, see you for the next Brand Square.